Devil Hogs and Squatches I didn't grow up in the same way that my brother and cousins did. They took after my father and their fathers who were much like my grandfather. As a teenager, I enjoyed playing tennis and reading comic books. They all liked spending every weekend hunting or fishing. I never saw anything wrong with what they did, I just didn't like to do it. My brother teased me quite a bit while we were growing up, but never in a harsh way. My father never said anything, but I could see in his eyes that he was disappointed when I would refuse an invitation to go on one of their weekend trips. A few times I would take them up on the offer when they were going fishing. I liked getting out in the sun and I enjoyed the conversation the three of us would have in the boat. Not enough to go every weekend, but I would go a few times each summer. I did it mainly to make my father happy. He was a good man, and he worked hard to give my brother and me all we needed. Doing something that made him happy was the least I could do. Looking back now, I wish I had gone a few more times with them. It wouldn't have killed me to do that. I now realize that shooting a deer or a duck or some squirrels or catching some crappies or bass wasn't what any of it was about. It was about my father providing a chance for all of us to make the memories that we would treasure as we grew older and older. Hunting and fishing was what he knew, so that's what he used to give us a chance to be together. He and mom came to my tennis matches and I should have gone fishing more. Mom and Dad are both gone now. My brother is, too. A defective heart and the big C took my parents. A muscled-up 70-model Dodge Charger ignoring a red light took out my brother. My sister went with her husband out to where the pretty people live in California, and she never came back. I stayed here to help people with their insurance claims in a 6 by 6 cubicle where milky versions of Barry Manilow songs are forced through the speakers that are set into the ceiling tiles. Every day I look on my small desk at the photo of my wife and daughter and I understand more about why getting out and making memories was so important to my father. I have a great wife and she's the best and my daughter is so much fun to be around. She's 10 now, and she and I play tennis a couple of times a week on a really crappy public court at the town park. My wife used to play, but she blew out her knee. That's a shame. That scar doesn't belong on legs as nice as hers. And now she comes with us and doles out the Gatorade from our cooler and makes a big production of keeping score. My daughter has beaten me many times, and one win was actually legitimate. Twice each year we go somewhere for a week. They like the theme park and the attractions where you have to sell a kidney so that you can afford one of those absurd beanies with the big plastic ears mounted to the sides. That place isn't for me, but to them, they both giggle and smile all day long until they're both too tired to giggle and smile. I'll put up with all the other expensive nonsense. A job that I don't like, but I'm able to stand and a family that is a far better one than I deserve, a nice enough house and two cars that still have life in them, well, that should be enough for anyone. I truly believed it was enough for me. I didn't complain as much as some that I know, mainly because I didn't think I had a right to. I wasn't happy at all every day, but I was happy enough most of the time. Or I thought I was until one day when I received a letter from someone that I hadn't heard from in years. I had, well, I have a cousin that I always liked. We had nothing in common, but I still liked him. He would never be accused of being the sharpest knife in the drawer. If they were ranking the sharpest knives, this particular cousin would have been a spoon. But as far as nice guys went, he was right up there on top would be the first to give you the shirt off his back. Of course, it was pretty hard to get him to put that shirt on. I can't say for sure that I ever knew what he did for a living. He was always busy, but nobody ever knew at what. Maybe he just did various jobs for under-the-table cash, and maybe he dug ginseng or peddled homemade liquor. One of my uncles said that he was sure that this man was an undercover agent for the CIA. Well, I don't recall him getting any takers to join him in that belief. 
His own mother said once that she believed he dug up Indian mounds and Civil War graves to sell what he found to collectors, metals and jewelry and such. That one I wouldn't have put past him, but I never heard any proof of that. Whatever he did, it didn't matter to me. He fooled around and somehow got married. She was a pretty girl that I only met one time when I was fairly young, but as we grew older, all we saw or heard from each other was less and less. I suppose most families can say things like that. I did hear that he ended up having three or four children with that wife that wasn't a surprise to me. The surprise was that one of his children had recently been accepted into a rather well-known university, and two years earlier than she was even supposed to graduate high school at that. He had actually hauled off and sired a genius, and that was what the letter was all about. Apparently, everyone he had ever been related to and that was still alive received this same letter. This college that wanted her to get her education with them was offering her a full ride. The letter said that, and also said that despite their offer, there would still be expenses. There would be clothes and pencils and posters for her to hang up on her wall, a car to get around in once she was actually old enough to get a license. And he named a whole list of things he and his wife were going to have to spring for, and I only named a few of them here. What he needed was dough and he needed it quick, and I started to throw the letter away right then. Someone that most of us hadn't seen in years is now reaching out for us to mail him cash. Well, I wasn't going for that, but I reluctantly kept reading. And as I sit here today, I'm still not sure if I'm glad or not that I did. I kept reading, and I was shocked to find that he wasn't wanting everyone to send him folding money like he was a television preacher. He was actually trying to give something to all of us. One of the favorite places that my father and brother and everyone else we were related to used to enjoy disappearing to on their hunting and camping trips was a large tract of property that was owned by this cousin's father. It had been in his family name for years. It didn't lay very well and no worker development or improvements had ever been done to the property a handful of small cabins had been built over the years here and there on the property for the men who went there to use when they went hunting, but that was it. For the most part, it still looked like it had before it had been owned by anyone. Twenty years now since I was there, and it likely looked more like that. But my cousin had found someone who was willing to buy it from him. With a lot of money and twice as much imagination, I suppose it could be turned into something usable. I guess this buyer felt the same way. What my cousin was offering me and any of us who were still alive and had an interest was the chance to go there and tromp around before the new owners took it over and turned it into a strip mall or a gated community or whatever they had in mind for it. He was affording us the opportunity to rediscover something that we may have lost or mislaid from our youth. I thought the gesture to be a very kind one, and then I just didn't think about it anymore. The place had never held much appeal for me when I was a youngster, and the desire to go back there had not grown with the passing of years. I briefly considered mentioning it to my wife and daughter to see if they wanted to give roughing it a go for a couple of days, but absence of Wi-Fi and squatting behind bushes to pee was not their idea of a good time. I was glad because it wasn't mine either, even with my not having to squat to pee. So I laid the letter back so I could have the address for my cousin. I wasn't going to go, but I thought I ought to write and thank him for the offer and to congratulate him on his daughter's accomplishment. Later that evening, while we sat at the table having supper, I watched my wife and my daughter communicate with each other by way of eye rolls and head tilts. I won't lie and say that I knew what they were up to, but I did know that they were up to something. It was something they thought was too big to just up and say or ask about. The dead giveaway was the hamburger helper that we were eating. Now, I really like it. And my daughter, not so much. My wife can't stand it. They were forcing it down their throats to butter me up for something I hadn't picked up on. So finally... 
I put my fork down and I demanded to know what was going on. They wanted to drive three hours to go to the beach for a three-day weekend at the end of the week. They wanted to go with my wife's best girlfriend and her two daughters and they didn't want me tagging along. I emptied more from the bowl into my plate while they told me how short their absence would seem. And while they were giving me the hard sell, I was thinking about all that I could get done that I had been neglecting. My wife even promised to make two more batches of the helper and put it in the food saver containers before going so I could have it every night while they were gone. I stayed very quiet and pretended to act left out for a while, but when my daughter really started to worry about me, I gave her a wink and she ran squealing to her room to start picking out clothes to take with her. That was when I changed my mind about my cousin's offer, and I told my wife where I would be while she was trying to dislodge sand from all those places that sand is great at getting into. What I didn't tell her was what I had become interested in reading about over the last couple of months. So while they were carrying on upstairs, I thought about how providential it had been that the letter came at the same time as my two wanted to get away and as I had become interested in this new thing. It had started at the dentist's office. While I was waiting my turn, I started reading an article in one of the complimentary magazines. It was all about the legitimacy of the so-called Bigfoot creature. Just like everyone else, I had heard the term Bigfoot, but I couldn't remember ever having the first opinion as to one existing or not. But the more I read, the more I started to wonder, and I wondered enough that when I left, I was carrying the magazine with me, with the dentist's permission, of course. On the way home, I stopped by the bookstore and I bought two books written by self-proclaimed experts on Bigfoots or Bigfeets. I'm still not sure what the plural word is for these creatures. I even ordered three books later that night online. I have a corner in my room in the house where I keep a small desk and a lamp. Sometimes I bring work home with me to do on weekends, and sometimes I just use it for reading. I guess it's my version of a man cave. My girls give me that much in the house that I pay for each month. So these creatures became my new interest to read about and study. I was fine with leaving it right there, but then that letter came. My wife and the smaller version of her hit the trail two hours before sunrise that Friday. Ten minutes after they pulled out, I did too. I had all my books and two coolers full of ice, and water and sodas and granola bars. The drive to my cousin's property would take about the same amount of time as the drive to the coast would for my girls. They were going to lay on the sand in the sun and I was going to plunge into the briars and the thickets. They were going to get tanned, and I was going to get scratched up and probably rashes. All three of us were looking forward to our respective adventures. I had called my cousin a couple of days earlier, and I told him that I was going to go goof around in the woods for two or three days. Well, he was surprised that I was going there, to say the least, but he was happy, I think. But I know he was surprised. When I asked him in strict confidence if he'd ever heard anything about Bigfoot sightings on the property, I knew that just because he owned some grown-up acreage that saw very little human traffic, the odds of there being a Bigfoot there, just because I now wanted to see one, were about a hundred bazillion to one. But I asked anyway. Well, there was a pause. Not his normal one, which he is well known for. This one was substantial enough that I thought the sketchy communications in his area had finally rolled over and said uncle, but he finally spoke again. What has you thinking that you want to see one of those things, he asked. Well, there was something in the way he had asked the question. He wasn't being loose as he'd always been the other times that I had talked to him. He was sounding a little scared to me and he had never seemed scared of anything. My father had always said that my cousin was too stupid to be scared, and that's what would get him killed one day. Oh, I'd just been doing some reading up on him and got a bit interested, I told him. You come on down and I'll take you over to the Little Wahatchee River instead. Every creek that runs in that river always has good digging for airheads. 
We'll get enough to fill a cigar box and you can take them home to look at with that daughter of yours, he said. So, are you saying that it would be a waste of my time going there to look for one of these things? You're saying that all these years no one has ever seen anything like a Bigfoot or a Bigfoot sign? I said to him. Well, that ain't what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's more things out in those ridges than white-tailed deer. Things that someone green as you hasn't got any business poking, he said. So you think that the minute I step out of my car, I'm going to get mauled and eaten because I'm a tender in the woods, I said to him. Well, not the first minute you step out, I don't. But I don't think you know what you're getting yourself into, and that's just me being honest for your own damn good, he said. Well, why don't I come by and get you first? We'll go together. I could use a guide and the company. You could make sure that I don't come to a bad end, I suggested. If you go up to Foggy Breaks, you're going alone. I went in there once when I was a youngster, back before you were even born. I said I'd never go back in there, and I haven't, and I'm not going to either. Everyone else went, and they stayed to the edges around the opening so they could take a shot at a deer. But they never went in where it's dark and silent. But I did, and I won't do it again. I'm fond of my family, and I have a girl child who's going to do real good for herself, and I intend on seeing her to do it. And no damn squatch or anything else is going to prevent me from that, he said. So you do think that there's some of them back in there, I asked. I've told you all I'm going to say on this subject. If you go, it'll be your own doing. If you go back home afterward, you can call me and we'll talk about whatever you want, but not about whatever you see or don't see back in there. And if you don't make it back home, then I guess this was our last conversation. You were always a smart boy. Now use some smarts now and make your decision. Might be the most important one you'll ever make, he said. He hung up before I could say another word, and I knew he wouldn't answer if I called him back. I thought about nothing else for the next day and a half while I decided what to do. I had my wife and daughter to think about, and they were the most important things in the world to me. But so was this important now. Not about seeing Bigfoot, just being there and proving to myself that I could go and come back. This personal quest had come up from out of nowhere and consumed me in short order. I have no idea where it came from, but now I knew that I had to go to this place and see what was there. I hoped that my father and brother would be looking down and watching, and I wanted to prove something to them also. I didn't know what my wife and daughter were doing at that moment. I didn't know what I thought I was supposed to be doing myself, and I had no idea where I was supposed to be going now that I was there. My four-door mid-size, with a gym bag and two Prince tennis rackets in the trunk, definitely wasn't an off-road vehicle. Wherever I went from here, it was going to have to be on foot. There was no camo and no hiker boots for me. I was wearing khakis and Stan Smith tennis shoes. I put my backpack full of water bottles and power bars on over the top of my Ron John Surf Shop t-shirt, and I headed into the wilds. It really didn't seem so wild, not while my car was still sitting in sight. But when I could no longer see my car, I knew I was out of my comfort zone and I was somewhere that I didn't belong. I began looking hard at the surroundings and the terrain. The Squatch experts that had written the books that I had been studying from told of different types of environments that these things tended to be comfortable in. The problem was that I wasn't sure that I would recognize a favorable habitat if I saw it. If they were looking down at me, I'm sure that my father and brother were about to bust a gut at how out of place I was. I stuck to the overgrown road that the 4x4s had used back when this place was being used. I could remember the road when it came time to find my car again and it was easier walking. The quiet was what really put the zap on me. Every once in a while I would hear a bird chirp out or startle a rabbit from where it had been hunkering and hiding, but for the most part all I heard was my footsteps until I stopped and then I heard nothing. 
After a couple of hours of walking, I realized that I was starting to think as the writers of those books had wanted me to think. I was looking for low-lying areas, the places that were dark and secluded, the places where there wasn't ever going to be much foot traffic. I was also looking for water. Logic told me that one of these things would prefer to make its home where it wouldn't have to travel so far to get a drink. I was hoping that I had reasoned that out logically and wasn't just assuming that a Bigfoot would act that way because it was what I would probably do. I had to keep reminding myself to think the way the writers had said to think, not how I wanted to think. My survival knowledge wasn't something that I could be relied on. I spent the rest of the afternoon slipping through those dark timbers. The farther I went, the gloomier it became. Blackberry bushes and sporadic laurels had been replaced with ferns and gnarled vines. It looked like the jungles they used to have in the old Tarzan movies. Well, I looked at my watch and I was shocked to see that I had been walking for almost eight hours. That didn't mean that I was miles and miles away from my car. I had been walking slowly and trying to notice everything, but it wasn't just back over the hill behind me either. At a full-out sprint, Maybe I could be back to the auto in three hours, probably more like four. And that was when the fear really began to settle in on me. What had I been thinking coming out here like this? I wasn't prepared for something like this. I had four bottles of water, seven chocolate and raspberry truffle bars, and a pocket knife. Daniel Boone was probably rolling over in his grave from shame. I knew what time it was, but that didn't mean I knew if it would be dark soon. I knew when it was getting dark where I lived, and the street lights came on when it was growing dark there. There were no street lights where I was at. I wanted to find a place where I could sit and be comfortable until it was light again, and I didn't want to be trying to find a place like that in the dark. I looked until I found a couple of trees of some sort that had grown up so near to each other that they were connected at the base. It was like having a three-foot wall behind me. I sat down and leaned against the trees. I could see everywhere around me other than behind me, and I figured that was as good as I was going to find. I had considered going and buying a tent before coming to do this, one of those small things that is only large enough to crawl into to go to sleep, but I knew it would be warm and the forecast wasn't calling for unpleasant weather. And in my wisdom, I asked myself, why should I buy a tent when it would never be used again after I returned home? Well, not buying one was not my finest hour, but I didn't have one now, and so I was going to make the best out of the situation. My legs were tired and trembling despite my practice of tennis playing. Today had not been like anything I was used to. I stretched my legs out and I leaned back. It was actually rather peaceful where I was at and I found my eyelids getting heavy as the darkness spread through the trees. I hadn't seen any big feet but I hadn't died either. Satisfied with batting a 500, I didn't fight the sleep when it came. Something during the night, I don't know when, I was too busy, scared out of my mind to look at my watch. That's when the noises started. I didn't know what they were and I didn't care. I just wanted them to go away and never let me hear them again. It was pitch black and I couldn't see a thing, but I wouldn't have turned a flashlight on even if I'd thought to bring one. I didn't want to see what's making all that fuss but I did know that all the noise was coming from not far away. Besides all the grunting and squealing and terrified sounding hollering, I could hear dry limbs being broken and what I now believe to be rain after rain of dirt and dirt clods falling back to the ground after having been thrown into the air. And it sounded to me like the sounds were coming from everywhere, but I sat very still and I focused. After a time, I came to understand that the sounds were not behind me. They were maybe to my sides and definitely down in front of me, but at least I wasn't surrounded. The way behind me was clear for me to run quietly away from whatever was in front of me, but I couldn't see anything. I wouldn't know where I was running. I could easily trip over something and break a bone or fall in a hole or run into more of what I was running away from. 
But what made me stay where I was was that I was afraid of getting hopelessly lost. I was pretty sure I could find my way out and back to my car in the daylight, but in the dark, I was sure that I would get turned around several times and end up having no idea where I was. I was terrified of what was in front of me and scared to leave. I should have stayed home and watched reruns while eating Hamburger Helper. This was beyond stupid on my part. I was hoping that I was hearing the noises getting louder just because whatever was down there in the dark was making a bigger fuss, but I knew that whatever it was was coming nearer to me. I was hoping that if I sat very still, whatever was down there would not see me. But while I sat there trembling, I began to remember things that I had overheard my father say to my brother. Things about animals being able to see so much better than a man can, and how they can smell from great distances because it means their survival. How a man trying to be in the woods without being noticed is the same as an animal walking through your living room without you noticing them. The woods are their houses, and they notice everything. I thought about doing something I hadn't done since I was ten and climb a tree, but the pine thickets were far behind me. Once the woods had become dark and quiet, there was nothing but hardwood trees with no limbs to grab onto until you were forty or fifty feet up, and the noises were getting louder. I knew I wasn't far from that old four-by-four road, and I knew that I couldn't stay where I was. I made the decision to try and ease my way over to the road while the decision to do anything was still mine to make. It was still dark, but I thought I would be able to tell the difference between the road and untouched ground. I gathered my backpack and I put it on. As quietly as I could, I stood up and I didn't move while I listened to the noises. It was terrible. Limbs snapping and leaves rustling, shocked and painful sounding screams were coming from things that definitely were not human. Well, I slid myself around behind the tree and I started backing away to my left. I didn't think it was far to the road, but with taking baby steps, it was going to take a while to get anywhere. Five minutes after beginning my move, I could still see the tree where I had been sleeping and the noises were still getting louder. Once I was sure that I was back on the road, I quickened my pace. I was still walking mainly backwards so that I could see if anything came after me, but I was walking faster and that made me feel a bit better. I was still fairly sure that I was going to pee in my pants at any moment, but at least I was putting distance between myself and whatever had been in front of me. I couldn't hear as many specific little sounds that I had been able to earlier. There was still a real something going on, but it seemed as if it was fading. I began to get my breath a bit more normally, and I tried giving jogging a try. My legs were wobbly, but I pushed and felt better about how I'd handle things overall. And then the woods and bushes exploded in front of me. Black and red miniature tanks were everywhere. The squealing was deafening. There must have been a dozen or more wild hogs running at me and stopping just short so that they could put a paw to the ground and shake those misshapen heads at me. Their tusks caught what little light there was and they gleamed, and their eyes were evil-looking as they charged at me. It was as if they were trying to provoke me into running. They wanted to chase. If I stood still, I knew that they would grow tired of waiting and they'd finally come after me. But if I ran, they would follow me and mow me down. One of them darted by me like it had been shot from a gun. He came so close that when he shook his head as he passed me, its tusk caught the fabric of my khakis and ripped it to shreds. I could feel the blood running down across my ankle and into my tennis shoes. The one in front of me that had been blocking my way must have smelled the blood about the same time that I began to feel it running down my shin, and it kept taking one of those hairy hooves, and by pawing at the ground, he would throw giant wads of dirt and leaves onto its back and onto the hogs that were behind it. 
It kept shaking its head as if my bleeding had somehow made it insanely angry. One that I could not see had come up from behind me and plowed its head in between my legs. It was shaking its head like the paint mixer down at the hardware store. With every twist of its head, I could feel those tusks cutting me. I could feel every one of those slices to my legs. I had to do something or my family was going to be without me, but I didn't know what to do. I was frozen while the hogs toyed with me, and when they grew bored, I was going to die. I was sure of that. They kept squealing or screaming or whatever it is they do, and it was everything I could do not to fall. I was sure that if I did fall, I would never get back up again. When they all grew quiet, not for very long, just long enough to lift their ears some and all look in the same direction, and then they started in again. But when the second crash in the bushes came, they forgot all about me. I could barely see it in the darkness of the trees, but when it stepped out into the old road, I could see it plainly enough then. I'm just a fraction over six feet tall, and this thing towered over me by more than two feet. It started hollering, and that made the wild hogs squeal even louder. A couple of them charged at this giant hairy thing, and one of them buried its tusk into the thing's leg. But it jerked free and kicked the hog and sent it flying into the brush. There was so much commotion and noise that I couldn't think straight, and I could feel my shoes sliding around on my feet because of the slick blood that they were slowly filling with. I wanted to run while all these things were focused on each other, but I was scared to move and I wasn't entirely sure that I could even walk without falling. And then one of the hogs, the one that had been standing in front of me, lowered his head and went straight at the hairy giant beast. Maybe it had thought to ram the thing hard enough with its head that the squatch would lose its balance and possibly tumble to the ground, but it didn't. Instead, it reached down, just as the hog neared, and it picked the hog up off the ground. Its head and hooves were flailing about like a windmill in a hurricane, and the more it squealed, the louder the thing that held it would scream at it. Quick as a wink, the squatch opened its large mouth and drove its head toward the hog. I could see thick yellow teeth in that giant's head, and it buried those teeth into the neck of that hog and bit down and then pulled. Hair and hide and muscle were dangling from the squatch's mouth, and the hog went limp. Maybe it had wanted to eat the hog, but if so, then that would be later. It threw the hog at the others that were still running back and forth and pawing at the ground. And when the dead one hit the ground, the remaining ones rushed the squatch and tried to attack it from every angle possible. But the squatch was kicking and swatting at the hogs while he kept bellowing at them. When the dust they had all stirred up became so thick that I could only hear the hogs but not see them, I tried out my legs and I found that I could walk fairly well. It hurt as badly as anything I had ever experienced, but I could walk. I walked away into the brush on the opposite side of the road where the war was going on, and once I was into the brush again, I turned in the direction I needed to go in order to get to my car that was so very far away. I watched as I walked, and I saw two more hogs fall with a thud to the ground, but that didn't mean that the others let up. I heard them all squealing and screaming long after I could no longer see them. I didn't feel safe, but since I no longer could hear anything near me, I stopped and poured two bottles of water over the multiple cuts to my legs. I wanted to sit and rest, but I knew better than to do that. I took off my shirt and I tore it in half and then I wrapped the legs as best as I could. After a few steps, though, the makeshift bandages had fallen together around my ankles. But I didn't stop to try and adjust them. I just kept walking. It was two hours after the sun had risen when I finally saw my car. And that was when I broke down and cried for a minute. There had been plenty of times during the night when I had doubted making it back. But now the relief that washed over me after having made it was uncontrollable. It was my intention to drive the three or so hours back to town where I live and go to the hospital's emergency room to get my legs seen about. 
I know several people that work in that hospital, and I thought knowing them might make things better. But after an hour I had been on the road, my injuries were burning and throbbing so much that the pain was worse than it had been while I was being attacked. I took an exit to a town that I knew was big enough to have a hospital of its own, and a friendly policeman that I stopped to ask directions from escorted me over there and saw that I made it inside without problems. I called my wife from my room once I had been admitted, and I assured her that she need not cut her vacation with our daughter short, but they both walked into my room six hours later. I stayed in that hospital for four more days while they pumped antibiotics into my arms. I was in my hometown hospital for nearly two weeks after that. The tusk of those hogs had not only cut me to ribbons, they had passed along an infection that took some time to get under control. There was lots of cutting and grafting before they were sure that I would be fine given the time. As he had asked, I still have not called my cousin about any of what happened. I haven't told many people. I just haven't. I know more now than I did know. I know what I saw. I know that I'm lucky to still be alive. I know that I'm no longer curious about anything having to do with Squatches or Bigfoots. That is completely out of my system now. And I know that I will be the first one to go walking around in the mall if they build one where those things nearly killed me that night. I hope every Squatch and Devil Hog starves to death. Mm-hmm.